Next, how food trucks have evolved with delicious results. Then, it's a look back to the Kahiki and its own tropical rainstorm. And America's first fast food restaurant. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance and for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Mortime Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State, changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you. We're here at the Hills Market in downtown Columbus, a perfect example of how large grocery stores have evolved to smaller corner stores that still offer a good selection for lunch and dinner. Food trucks, though, now there's an example of food evolution as the humble taco has been passed up by Korean noodles and spicy South African Cape Malay street food. I had a chance to check out a few of the more unusual dishes. Take a look. Food trucks are such a big part of the food scene in Columbus now, I have been wanting to find out more about it. So now I'm on my way to a place called the Food Fort, where the operators park their trucks, where they restock, and we're just gonna see what we can find out here. I'm excited you. that you're here, finally get a chance to talk about your interest in food trucks. Yes, it sounded like this place, the food fort, is kind of where it all starts from. Can you tell me about what the trucks do here? What do you do for them? Absolutely. Well, this, we feel that this is a hub of food industry in Columbus, especially for mobile businesses. Uh, ECDI was started in 2004, and one of the things that we identified fairly early on, the need of food-based businesses to have access to space. We built a food fort, which is our commercial kitchen and an incubator, and then the next phase was to have food trucks that would park here and use our services. It's gotta take money to get a food truck started, does ECDI help with that part of the business? Absolutely. We help start up an existing businesses with mentorships, training, technical assistance, incubation, and access to capital. Okay, and in the meantime, you've got a whole corral out there full of food trucks. Is it okay to just walk out there and Absolutely. meet Absolutely, I of think them? the best thing to do is to actually talk to one of our food trucks. Well, I sure appreciate you taking time to talk today, and uh, I think I'm gonna go out here and see what I can find. Hi, you have to be Travis. I am. Thanks for wearing the t-shirt. Yeah, I gotta represent. <laughs> uh, absolutely, good to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Um, you have had a food truck for some time now, right? Mm -hmm. How oh, long? Three years. Three years, yep. okay. And did you jump right in as a food truck operator or you migrated into it from the restaurant business? Now, I've been in the restaurant industry for almost 25 years. Um, and it was kind of a transition initially when I had left my last establishment. It was going to open a brick and mortar, but um, when it comes down to financing and get everything set in place, 
It was a lot easier to jump in the food truck world than it was back into the brick and mortar world, which is a lot more expensive. And it sounds like um, you have really got a business that's up and going and it's been successful. What are some of the pitfalls for a new food truck operator? It's, it's definitely tough. It's, um, you know, the, the difference between being in a restaurant versus a truck is the elements definitely play a larger role in your day-to-day -day sales. So if it rains, you know, you're, you're going to see a loss in sales. You are bouncing from location to location. You're hoping that your followers are going to go on to a site like Street Food Finder, which all trucks really use to list where your locations are. Presumably you came up with a product that was going to be really well prepared, really good, but then you have to keep it going. Mm -hmm. Well, that's definitely a tough thing. I mean, anyone can put a product out that people were going to like, but what it really comes down to is, you know, aside from the quality of your product, building a brand and kind of establishing yourself to give people something that they want that's something that's a little bit different. You can't just say, oh, well, I make a, a wonderful chicken salad for my family reunions. I'm gonna start my business off that because you're not gonna be successful. You really have to get down and be business savvy about it and realize that this just isn't something fun to do on the weekends. If you're gonna make a go at it, you have to be smart. You gotta lay out you know, your prospectus. You have to lay out an entire business plan on, on how you wanna execute it, and you gotta stick by that business plan. Travis, thank you, it's it been a pleasure. a pleasure. Okay, now I'm headed over to one of the food trucks that I've been to before. It's called Queen's Table, and they have the best fish sandwiches. Only this time, I will get to see what it's like on the inside. Hey. Hey, how you doing? I'm fine, Ellen? how are you? I'm good, I'm good. Really happy to see you and your food truck today. Thank you for coming out. So what are some of the challenges that you face running a food truck? How tough is it to, to really maintain a clientele and um, be successful? Um, it's, it's, it's some work, but I think with consistency, with our product and everything, and I think people like it. I think it has really good flavors. Something different than your average fish sandwich, a fish boat, that's the name of it. Now, why did you call it a fish boat? It's still a fish sandwich, but right. why a fish boat? Because it's, it's bigger than and better than the other fish sandwiches, so just something to add on to it. And it kind of shapes like a canoe, it's long. Okay, so it makes sense that you call it a fish boat just because of that nice oblong bun and those big old pieces of fish in there. But really, I have been dying to see the inner workings of a okay. food truck. Can we take a look inside? Yes, we, might. Yes, we can, yes. All right, this is the makings of a fish boat. We put our tartar sauce on our bun, it's usually Two to three nice fillets of fish. Two to One. three? Two to three, yes ma'am. That's a lot of fish. Yes ma'am, we, we try to give you your money's worth. Oh yeah, you don't go away from here hungry. Yes ma'am. Then we top it off with our shredded cabbage, onions, and tomatoes. That's finished? That's finished. Now do we eat? Yes. Okay. Time to go. How is that? Delicious. Good, good. Who taught you to cook fish like this? Ah, uh, my mother. Really? My mother. Yes. Where is she from? She's from here. She's from here. What do you see as your future? I mean, how, how long do you think you can run a food truck? How long do you think they'll stay popular? I think it's, it is the future. I think it's here to stay because we, you can, we can do many things. We can do weddings. We can do uh, graduation parties, we can do anything. We can actually pull up to your doorstep if you want that. Elvin, we have really, really enjoyed our visit with you. Thanks so much for letting us come get the inside look at what you do. You're welcome. Thank you. And thanks for the great fish sandwich. Maybe we'll see you on the truck sometime. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just like we did today. Right. That's how you'll see me on a truck. <laughs> All right. Yes, yeah, thank you. Next, a South Seas experience at the Old Kahiki. Then, a look back at the first of its kind, the Slider. Once upon a time, themed restaurants were all the rage. The boathouse is still going, as is the Ringside Cafe. At the Kahiki, patrons were immersed in the South Seas, complete with an indoor tropical rainstorm. Kiki culture was something that was largely invented in the United States 
and it just you know, grew like wildfire then from the 30s to the 40s to the 50s, then to the 60s where the Kiki was built. The thing that people took away from the Kahiki, most of all, was the initial impression of this enormous, unusual looking building near Whitehall in Columbus. It was designed by Bernie Altenbach, who was their architect, designed to look like the New Guinea Meeting House, but some people see it as an inverted war canoe. They put a little moat in front of it, put these huge moai on either side of the door with flaming pots on their head, and you were in a different world immediately when you pulled into the parking lot. A lot of this has been designed by Coburn Morgan. And then yeah. Philip Keynes did most of the moai work. Right, working from Coburn sketches. Mm -hmm. And they also used art students from local colleges and things to create some of this. You walked in and you crossed running water. You have fish tanks on the left side, you had the, the rainforest on the right, and the very back you had this huge fireplace. You had exotic details everywhere. Every surface was either carved or painted. Well, I think one of the funniest stories was a patron coming inside, sitting down and looking into the fake rainforest. Looked out the window, saw the rain coming down, became concerned and ran out and put the top up on his convertible. convertible. That's how um, real the effects were. And that was the idea. It was an immersive experience where you were sitting in little pods that had you no know, roofs over them in your wicker chairs being served these very exotic drinks, some of which were smoking because they had dry ice added well, to them. Well, and then with the international staff, you could be being served by somebody who wasn't necessarily a native English speaker. You had a number of Cuban refugees working on the staff. You had the Japanese and Chinese wives of servicemen working. At a time, they put out an ad and they said, we're from over 15 different countries and we speak even more languages than that. And over the lifetime of the Kahiki, it became even more international and more international. The founders, Bill Sapp and Lee Henry, prided themselves on the fact that they did bring in all these people from different cultures into their restaurant. And for a lot of them, it was their first job in the United States, and they were just learning English. They had their costuming that was quite elaborate in the early days. You created this whole new cuisine. Here, you were taking what was essentially Cantonese recipes, yes. adding in pineapple and other things to make this fictitious mm -hmm. Polynesian cuisine. There's um, a saying about tiki culture that you have the, the food from like Japan and the alcohol is from Cuba and you know every, every piece of it's from someplace else. You have the Hawaiian textures and flower patterns and it really is a bunch of cultures all coming together into a melting pot. The drinks. Polynesia, they didn't have rum. Almost all these drinks were rum-based. One of the things people always ask about is the mystery girl, yes. a mystery drink. This was something they'd actually borrowed from a restaurant down in Fort Lauderdale called the Mai Kai. Well, you would order the mystery drink mm -hmm. and then they would sound the gong, which at the beginning was a giant gong. It was like four foot in diameter. Exactly, and the mystery girl would come out, who was a separate waitress, she wasn't someone you'd seen at all that night yet, would come out in her outfit with your drink. She would bow to the uh, fireplace that was the Moai, and she'd bring you your drink. This was kind of a showstopper. Whatever you were doing, you heard the gong, and everybody's attention turned to that. A number of famous people ate at the Kahiki. Margin Gower Champion came and, and Ginger Rogers. Zsa Zsa Gabor Zsa Zsa and Gabor. Um, Uncle Milty was there. Milt yeah, Pearl Milt stopped Pearl. in one time. And Paul Lynn from Mount Vernon Ohio boy. had an unbelievable following. Some of the first pottery was actually created by Marcy. Marcy Sapp, Marcy who was Sapp. Bill's wife. She'd gone down to Mexico and worked with ceramicists in Mexico with the idea that they would create this stuff and import it. But then when they imported the first batch, it was all broken by the all time broken, it got here. Yeah. So they knew they had to do it locally. So they just started a pottery in the basement of the mm -hmm. Kahiki. And Marcy worked on it along with family members, students, turning this original stuff out. And then later on, they worked with uh, Dick Hoffman, had yep. Hoffman pottery. 
and he created the, the later generations of mugs and all these different items that they used in the bar. So, you know, I always say there's three ways to get this stuff. You could buy it in the gift shop, you could steal it, or you could buy it many, many years later at auction. Yeah, and they, you know, made, I think they said 25 of the mystery drink bowls, and most of them disappeared. The thing about Bill and Lee, Lee liked to build restaurants. He kind of lost interest in them once they were up and running. Bill liked to run them. And so it was only reluctantly that Bill agreed to sell the Kahiki. So Bill and Lee sell to Mitch Boych and they immediately regret it. Michael Mitch Boych in his travels had met Michael So. And Michael So was a, a real rags to riches success story. He'd been built in China and came to the United States and worked up through the restaurant business. Mitch liked Michael So and he wanted to provide an opportunity for him and so he purchased the Kahiki, and after a few years, Michael So purchased the Kahiki from them. But he seemed to have been more interested in franchising. And so he started manufacturing egg rolls in the basement of the Kahiki. Mm -hmm. And he got contracts with Kroger, was selling them there. Then the Son of Heaven exhibition opened in Columbus. Son of Heaven was a very popular exhibition of Chinese art, and so it was an opportunity to get his Kahiki brand, Frozen Foods, in front of a much larger audience. The frozen food business really took off for Michael So. Sales are pretty much flatlined at the Kahiki. The restaurant needed a lot of renovation, and it was going to require a large infusion of cash. The neighborhood was also declining, too. Oh, absolutely. And so it was becoming less desirable for people to go there. And so then he got an offer from Walgreens to purchase the site and he began developing these plans for, okay, we'll sell this building and we'll open another one when we get the opportunity to. On the waterfront, on the Scioto River. He sold it, it closed in August of 2000, and five years later he died. The Kahiki was bulldozed and a Walgreens went up. And a local land developer who was working on building a CVS at the time actually was quoted by the dispatch as saying, well, at least I'm not tearing down the Kahiki. So that's how big a deal it was. People were really upset. For me, it's sad that it's gone because people, I think, would have been ready to embrace it again. It is kind of a lesson to us because there are gonna be other buildings here in Columbus that people are gonna to wanna to tear down. And you know that you need to get organized if you wanna save them. If you really firmly believe in this, do something. Today we know them as sliders, those little hamburgers you can eat in one bite. This next story touches on the history of White Castle, America's first fast food restaurant known for their square sliders that were sold by the sackful. Hi, Lisa. Hey, how are you? Great, good to see you. White Castle, is it true that White Castle might be the first fast food restaurant? If not the first, one of the, the very first in the country, yes. They were pioneering in, in the fast food business and a lot of the norms that we associate with the fast food business, having the same menu at every restaurant and going in and expecting to receive the same product whether we go to that restaurant in you know, one city or another city or another state or another country. That whole concept of standardization was very much pioneered by White Castle. Everything's white and very clean, that's not by accident, is it? No, no, not at, not at all. The, uh, in the 1920s, when they got started, 
hamburger stands and you know fast serve restaurants weren't necessarily thought well of. I mean, you found them at fairs, you found them along the roadside, maybe next to gas stations. They were and greasy spoons. Exactly, they weren't necessarily clean, and the, the the food was not necessarily of good quality. So part of what they were doing, in addition to sell, you know they're selling the hamburgers, they're selling this idea that you're going to get good service and everything will be will be clean. They used a lot of stainless steel in the restaurants, so when you went in, everything was very shiny. They coined the name White Castle. White was for purity and cleanliness, and then the castle was for strength and permanence and stability. They had bakeries. They established several bakeries to make the bread so that all their buns would be standard, and then they would ship their buns from their several bakeries to their restaurants. So the whole concept of standardization comes from them. We see a lot of paper products here we're familiar with today, the sacks and the and the hat and but the they, hamburger boxes The hamburger too. box, and they invented all this stuff, right? Yes, yes they did. It started with laundry. They wanted the, they called them operators, the people who worked in the restaurants, and they wanted them to wear white hats and white aprons and look very crisp and clean. After a 10 to 12 hour shift grilling hamburgers, those aprons were a mess and the hats were sweaty, and they were spending a lot on laundry trying to get grease out of these white aprons and white hats. So paper napkins were on the market, but all of these other products of paper were not necessarily. So Billy Ingram worked with engineers at a company in Wisconsin to develop a paper cap folding machine. You can see it, there's the original paper cap folding machine there in that picture. And once they got that working so that it could fold the paper caps, then they started with you know other paper products like the headbands and things like that. And they were supplying all of the White Castle restaurants with these products. And then they started supplying other restaurants and other companies. Um, there's one of the aprons. Uh -huh. That's a bit of a later one. We associate White Castle with Columbus now, but it didn't begin in Columbus, correct? No, no, it's, I mean, it's been here for a very long time, but it actually started in Wichita, Kansas uh, in 1921. The first restaurant in Columbus came in 1929, and then they moved their headquarters here in 1934. There's a picture of the kind of the familiar headquarters building, which is actually not going to be their headquarters for much longer as they're preparing to move to a new headquarters. I noticed these, there's, there's a poster here that emphasizes this thing about the beef. Can you tell about that? Oh that? yes, this is one of the this is one of the 100% beef posters. There were often signs posted in the restaurants that stressed this 100% beef so people would know exactly what was in the sandwich. They did have a, a recipe of which cuts of meat they wanted ground into their hamburger because they don't add anything. They, they kind of try to balance the fat in the meat so that they don't have to add anything to the hamburger once it gets on the grill. Show us some more posters, these are great. The, most of these posters probably date from around the 1940s and 1950s. This is an awesome, this one is, is awesome. We think of hamburgers going with french fries or onion rings or other side dishes. The second product at White Castle, their, their number two product for many, many years was coffee because when they started in the 20s and 30s, they were, they were open late, they were open, and people who worked second and third shifts were coming in to eat there, and coffee was, was their, their second product to hamburgers. So. Well, back then you couldn't go to a Starbucks on every co corner to get your coffee. So No, there weren't go, as many coffee shops either. We're, we're so familiar to White Castle now, we might take it for granted, but it's interesting to see that this company here in Columbus really kind of figured out fast food. They, they did. Even their dishes were innovative. Their dishes were never for sale. The china dishes that they used in the restaurants in the 20s, 30s, 40s, somehow a lot of people have them. So <laughs> they were never sold. But they started designing, they wanted to wash them in dishwashers. And they found when they put regular coffee mugs into the dishwashers, they would have puddles of hot water on the top. Well, that's why there's a little notch here. They called their, they, they got this brilliant idea that if we notch the mugs, the water will drain off. 
for example. So even something as simple as a coffee mug, they made some innovation to, to make it work better in, in the restaurants. This is a fascinating collection. Thanks so much for sharing it with us. You're very welcome. Thanks for being with us. And remember, you can catch all of our episodes on columbusneighborhoods.org. Plus, see our stories on the WOSU mobile app. And you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. When I was just a lad on my grandpa's farm, I used to spend my days out by the big red barn. I had lots of chores to do, but it was worth my while. Cause I knew at the end of the day, beware the big old smile. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance. And for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation, smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri, your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated, it just needs to be right. CODA keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Mortine Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State. Changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you.